Welcome back to the Mining Pod for this week's news roundup. Matt Kimmel of CoinShares joins me to talk about hash price, difficulty, Celsius mining, suing Core Scientific, and rhodium testing public markets. Matt, how's it going? Great. Another excellent Great. week. Good. Good. It's always happy over in CoinShares land. We love having you. Okay, we're going to do some fast takes on everything. Move it a little quicker this week. We got 20 minutes before you're off to a wedding to find some love. And I have to jump to another podcast. It's the life of a podcaster. So we'll start off talking about difficulty in hash price, which of course, difficulty went down last week or earlier this week, Tuesday rather, 2.14%, which was the first negative difficulty drop since July after I think four consecutive increases. So a little bit of a break for Bitcoin miners out there. Yeah, my take is that I think this is probably a temporary thing. I think miners are selling their hardware and they're finding new homes. I think that S19s are being delivered and some miners are sort of rolling over their machines and plugging in more efficient ones. Um, I think that a lot of miners that sort of really weren't operationally um, positive uh, from a margin perspective have kind of already wound up and left. But I think it's sort of a hodgepodge of those reasons. And we're sort of continuing to see uh, difficulty climb as the S19 XPs get delivered from Bitmain in the coming months. Yep, I think so as well. Like I, I don't think anyone's really caught off guard by this. Like a uh, increase by two percent, decrease by two percent. Like it's just going to be a few mines coming offline because energy price is too high and people are shuffling around miners to different jurisdictions. There's been a few reports of miners in Europe leaving and moving up north, like northern Europe, northern Scandinavia, and probably overseas. So I bet that has something to do with it as well if those reports are true. But you just have to look at hash price and see that's more or less all-time lows. Got a little bit of a break this week with the difficulty change. But yep, pretty simple stuff there. So we can leave it there. Hash rate check-in. Don't really need to do much on hash rate check-in, do we? Because it's just continuing to go up and to the right. Like We might have had a difficulty change, but hash rate was still clocking up. I think we're getting near 230 for the first time. Uh, I think a lot of people's proje- projections of 250 are going to be spot on. Um, Seems pretty likely for that to happen. Any take on that before we move on? Good luck to any prospective double spenders because we got a lot of hash rate going on here in Bitcoin land. That's about it. We do. We do. Okay, let's talk about Celsius. So there's actually a few lawsuits going around. We could talk about Compute North a little bit. Not really a lawsuit there, but court filings nonetheless. Chapter 11 bankruptcy, wading through all the assets, wading through all the treasury nodes so far. Uh, We'll put that aside because it doesn't seem like a lot has changed on the Compute North side for the Chapter 11. I think people are still trying to figure out what that means. But the Celsius lawsuit is also interesting and of note. It's between Celsius and Core Scientific. Core Scientific, of course, is one of the largest miners out there in the United States, both for self-mining and a significant hosting arm. They were hosting Celsius minings almost their entire operation. I think they're quoted to have up to 100 megawatts planned for deployments. But it looks like, according to this note, that only 70 megawatts was successfully completed. Uh, Of course, this is allegations. We don't know what's going on on either side yet. This is only Celsius side of the story. And I think it's also fair to say that people have a little bit of doubt about anything Celsius is saying based on what's going on in the past. But still important to see like something like this going on. Your take on it? Yeah, as you said, can't confirm anything yet. Right, but it seems like Core Scientific, kind of like Compute North last week, didn't have uh, fixed rate PPAs, right? Power agreements, and so they were selling a fixed rate to Celsius, and then they were having to cover in the spot market. I, I mean, it seems to me whether they were intentionally doing this or not, they're kind of short energy in that sense. You know, they could have you know hedged in the futures market as well to sort of create a a neutral position. But, you know, would these allegations come out if they were doing that? I don't think so. Um, I I think generally, right, across the board, 
as we go into the next bull market and the cycle kind of comes to close, we will see more and more financial experts enter into the mining industry for these reasons. Definitely. Yeah. Going back to the megawatt numbers, there's a bunch of different numbers quoted here in the allegation so far uh, in the lawsuit. And so we don't quite know. It just depends on the timelines, right? So in March, they're supposed to have a deployment that didn't go ahead because of delays, which is you know, a very common story right now. Uh, it seems that they got partially online, but by September, they still didn't have enough online. And by December of 2021, they still did not have machines online. Uh, so yeah, I, I think this story just <laughs> kind of what a lot of miners are dealing with. Really, like, let's be honest, it's really hard to get machines online. And from a hosting perspective, like, if you are working with a third party, you are taking on that risk. And sometimes it works out, right? The the idea is you don't have to pay for maintenance, you don't have to pay for security, you don't have to do any of that stuff. There's no hassle involved. You're just baking into your cost for hosting and then washing your hands of it and walking away. And it can be a very good strategy during normal times. But like you said, these contracts are stacked up against each other. So for a normal hosting provider like Core Scientific, they probably go and find cheap energy and they're probably buying spot just to make as much savings as they can. And then on top of that, they build in steady fixed rates with customers so then they can get fixed revenue per month. And it seems like that went against them in this situation. Of course, only one side of the story so far. We'll see what comes out in the future. But it seems like Core Scientific had that bet. Energy markets went against them, which we've seen with everybody this year. And then they had that fixed rate and had to figure it out with all their hosting providers who had contracts with them. This is a very similar story to many people out there right now. So it's nothing that's unusual. It is unfortunate, however. And it does tie into the larger Celsius story, which is this $1.2 billion hole in their balance sheet, which they're trying to figure out. They're actually trying to use the mining arm to get back out of a bankruptcy, which seems very dubious. The accounting on the worth of their assets uh, for mining specifically has been dubious to say the least. I think they have about 80,000 machines they could put online. Uh, might need to fact check myself on that, but it's a significant amount of machines. And yet they kind of pump those numbers when they've filed their chapter 11 bankruptcy notice and they expect those machines to perhaps get them out of bankruptcy. But I mean, if you're looking at mining economics right now, it makes no sense to think that. No sense at all to think that. Yeah. And we could see the energy markets affecting the mining markets, right? And, you know, just, just taking aside, it doesn't seem like anyone has a perception that's that's going to get much better in the future, right? The US is sort of draining their strategic petroleum reserve. We have had like demand destruction because COVID shutdowns in China. Um, we just saw sort of sabotage of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So, you know, taking it aside to talk about some current events, um, I'm not sure if that bodes well for miners. But I mean, this is something we'll continue to monitor in the coming weeks because the Celsius saga is it's interesting, right? And so is the Compute North and so is Core Scientific. These are major players. Um, and it'll be it'll be good to follow. Yeah, last thought on this is the relationship with ERCOT here. So ERCOT is basically a quasi-government slash enterprise agency that monitors uh, energy within Texas. Basically saying like, you can go on the grid, you can come off the grid, you can use energy from the grid, you can't use energy from the grid. And they've been having to play ping pong with a lot of Bitcoin miners. They've been having to deal with like rate adjustments. And ERCOT definitely gets like a little bit of notice within this uh, lawsuit. So I'm interested to see how that plays out. There's a lot of miners have been dealing with ERCOT and have been frustrated that they're not able to go online. Yet at the same time, ERCOT has responsibility to the grid and has a responsibility to all the other customers on the grid. And so I can see why they've been a little hesitant to plug in these huge mining operations. But we can leave it there. Let's go over to a different topic. Uh, we're going to talk about Rhodium, which is a large Bitcoin miner going public through a reverse merger with Silver Sun Technologies. This came out yesterday on the 29th. Uh, the initial IPO for Rhodium was actually supposed to take place in January with a $1.7 billion valuation. Doubt they have that valuation now, given that all markets have collapsed. It was interesting at the time when Rhodium filed for IPO because immediately the week after, they decided to pull that IPO and wait for the markets to happen. And now they're going through with it during basically you know bear market where valuations are much lower. Silver Sun Technologies, 
reverse merger here, SPAC, right? So they're getting some, basically using like their shell corporation and their ticker in order to get Rhodium public. And it looks like Silver Sun shareholders will get some cash. And of course, their stock already went up based on top of that. Throw it over to you, Matt. Yeah, cheers to Rhodium team for pushing this along, getting these sort of deals done. Of course, it's difficult to me. Rhodium, best known for sort of having liquid cooling operations, which is sort of a way to, you know, cool ASICs is kind of a trade off between CapEx and OpEx because you have to build out that infrastructure, but then supposedly you don't have to pay as much sort of air cooling operational costs, right, as you're actually mining. Um, yeah, my I guess my take on this is as sort of a data analyst, this is exciting because we get more public listed information on miners, but then the sort of um, Bitcoiner cypherpunk in me uh, doesn't like that more hash rate is under the guise of U.S. regulatory agencies. Yeah, this is a nice story for Rhodium. Uh, interesting that they're doing this. I want to actually pair it with the next story we're going to do, which is this new research from Arcane Research showing that most Bitcoin miners or at least public miners that we've data on have been net negative in terms of earnings. See, it's retained earnings or net negative. So they list a bunch of public miners, go through their expenses and against their uh, expected revenues. Shows that most of these miners have actually not been doing well. Uh, it's interesting because this is public data and then you pair it against Rhodium going public and like what is the expectation there? The fact that they still want to seek public markets and expose their books, whether good or bad, is notable. Uh, and then on top of that, I wonder how markets look into these things. They look at this data and say like, oh, you are not making money over the long term. Why should we put capital into you? Throw it over to you. I have a few thoughts on this. Um, I actually want to dig into the Arcane Report a little bit more because I definitely have some questions about it. But just these two stories together, interesting pairing. Yeah, I mean, mining industry struggling. I, I think this is sort of the results of stuff that we've been talking about over time, but Arcane sort of put proof to the pudding. Um, retained earnings is sort of a spot on your accounting books that sort of gets dumped into after you cover a lot of other things. It's typically, um, from what I've seen, a lot of sort of R&D budgets come out of positive retained earnings. Um, the fact that it's negative is clearly doesn't bode well for these mining companies and just hope to turn it around as the mining economic state sort of goes back to an upturn, right? We hope to see that in the coming months, but it you know may take a lot longer than that, right? As, as we've discussed, there's a lot of headwinds currently um, facing the mining industry. Definitely. And like, I want to bring out a few points here in this Arcane Research Report. Uh, the interesting thing to me is how they have this data. First of all, the fact that you can like go into public filings for the first time, that's very different from last cycle, right? Where we had no insights into miners books you just have some hearsay here and there. But now we have 20 plus public miners that we can actually go through their data. So first of all, I think that's interesting. Second of all, it's interesting how you look at these numbers and what you decide to count. Do you count Bitcoin based on its value right now? Do you count it based on the time it was mined? Uh, how do you value a company in terms of infrastructure? You know, ASIC prices are changing day by day. Therefore, the infrastructure built around those ASICs is also changing day by day. How do you look at stock compensation for all the employees and the higher ups at these companies? How do you value that? And then how do you value losses, right? When it's mostly paper losses at this point. Marathon's in here, right? They are, let's see, $357 million net retained earnings losses. That sort of looks like it's not the worst on the page, actually, believe it or not. Poor scientific is at $1.3 billion, followed by negative $569 million for Riot. But if you think about these things, like all three of those teams were pretty heavy on deploying assets. So Marathon made a lot of purchases in terms of machines and then also getting hosting allocations with Compute North and others. Riot, the Windstone facility, obviously, and some other places. Core Scientific has facilities all over the US and put a lot of money into that. So yes, they have chosen all very capital heavy methods to move the market. At the same time, they've used capital markets in order to do that. So I don't know how instructive this data really is. At the same time, I do think it's also, or it's just, I should say, let me rephrase that really quick, Damien. The last point I'd like to make about this is how irrational the markets can be when valuing these crypto equities. It's so difficult to do, and most people are still struggling to do it. 
And we saw that Compute North went under our chapter 11 last week. Marathon went down about 9%, 10% on that day, but they're still around. And like, I don't think anyone's not going to be allocating capital towards, towards Marathon, even with like this huge headache that they have to fix. And it's a very large problem for them. Uh, so that's notable. And the second is like lending is still a thing for a lot of these markets, right? Like people are still giving money to Bitcoin miners, even with this data that they have in front of them. So I think there's more to it. I think this data is instructive and like directionally correct, but there's definitely more to it. I'll just add to your first point there. It seems like all the public listed mining stocks are kind of just correlated with Bitcoin, right? And sort of move as proxies for, you know, a lot of investment funds that maybe cannot, you know, actually purchase Bitcoin outright. Um, and, you know, there's sort of restrictions and guidelines on what they could purchase. But, you know, public listed mining stocks, it's it's just an equity. Um, and so it's sort of a workaround if, if you want to get... Uh, exposure, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of separation on how they are actually managing their operations and finances that are separating them. It seems like um, more often than not, these stocks have really just been correlated, you know, pretty closely to Bitcoin. It, and and that's kind of the same with with gold mining stocks in a way as well. They sort of just trade with higher volatility. Um, and, but it'll be interesting to follow, like in the coming years, uh, as far as like timelines go, how these sort of mining stocks move and you know if it's if it's news based if it starts to be sort of decision based um, if it's sort of looked at it on an accounting basis and how they're valued um, it's it's a space that I think is is largely unexplored and will be iterate, iterated on um, in the future no good points there I had a conversation with Zach Bradford of Clean Spark this week we'll publish that next week on Tuesday so after this podcast comes out and we were talking about stock prices for Bitcoin mining. And his point was that a lot of these stocks just trade within a, a band based on Bitcoin and based on other mining stocks. And there doesn't seem to be really any correlation to the underlying activity of the firm itself and the strength of their balance sheet. CleanSpark obviously has been killing it this summer. Like They've made a lot of purchases. They've effectively doubled their hash rate while very, losing very little equity, deploying a lot of their cash. They've been cash heavy because they've been selling their Bitcoin this entire time and then moving that money right into operation. So they've run a very clean ship. And yet the market has not really awarded them for that. Uh, Market still looks at Marathon, still looks at Riot, still looks at a few others and awards them. Mostly because they're the first mover. And that was Zach's point that he brought up. Like They got a lot of headlines and now it's stuck in people's brains that if you're going to buy a mining stock, you're going to buy Riot or you're going to buy Marathon. And that's basically it. Maybe a few others. But that's just sort of how the markets are at this point. So we'll have to wait for another cycle, I think, to see like a breakout point where some of these really excellent teams, including Riot and Marathon, but some of these other excellent teams start to break past uh, the constrictions of like this band we're seeing with stocks. But I'll leave it there for my final thought. Anything you're looking forward to next week in terms of mining news or mining markets? I'm excited to continue following the sort of Compute North and Celsius sagas um, and, and how their Chapter 11s pan out. Compute North had another filing that came out towards the end of last week about having an auction to sort of sell some of their assets, maybe pay back their creditors in sort of different ways. Um, and so I think those are some really interesting ongoing stories that I look forward to following. Yeah, Compute North is definitely notable. There's a lot of teams out there with exposure to them. But hopefully the whole process goes pretty smoothly. And then Compute North as well can restructure and get back on their feet effectively pretty soon here. Uh, for myself, I'm interested in seeing what's going on with Ukraine conflict right now. There's some news this morning about uh, possibly... Ooh, what's the word? Basically Putin annexing a bunch of different Ukrainian uh, jurisdictions. And I'm wondering how it's going to affect energy markets. We've already seen a lot of chaos in energy markets. And then the Nord Stream pipeline going out last week was definitely troublesome. Uh, I think this is going to shake mining markets a lot over the coming weeks. Like I think there's going to be some max pain this summer or this winter rather. And I think that's going to change hash rates. So a lot of geopolitical stuff going on right now. It, last thought before we close out, it's crazy how much geopolitics affects Bitcoin mining hash rate just because of how dependent it is on where you're at the globe. Uh, hopefully hash rate is being you know, moved into better jurisdictions. And, or, well, I'm going to say that again. I just stuttered. Hopefully hash rate is being moved into better jurisdictions. 
the, the concentration in the US is getting a little troublesome. It's like 39% or something like that. But hopefully overall, we're moving towards a better place. Matt, any final words of wisdom before we close out? No, I got nothing. Let's just close out. Wisdom. Push it to the weekend. Enjoy everybody. Get some sunlight. Maybe follow some geopolitics. Maybe go to a wedding. That's what I'm doing tonight. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, you're giving us some some words of wisdom about love and happiness and getting <laughs> off of Twitter to get to go to a wedding. Exactly. Tune in to next week to find out Matt's take on love. There we go. There we go. Cool. All right. See you next week. <laughs>